A jail stint can really disrupt someone's life. You can lose a job, a relationship, or thousands of dollars on fees, fines, and bail. Have I ever gone to jail? Yeah, I just got out, actually. If he doesn't show up to court, we gotta pay the $50,000. No ring exchange, no kiss the bride. There's no glamour in a jailhouse wedding. <laughs> Off the block. All six episodes tracing the path from city block to jail block and back are now available on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW, this is Here Be Monsters. It's hard to describe what 100,000 square feet of pest world looks like. It's big, big enough so that voices and words turn into soup, and it's big enough to give you sore feet. It's two football fields, side by side, with a 25-foot ceiling. Everywhere I looked, I could see booths and vendors from the pest management industry. I got a t-shirt from a pesticide company, and mouse-shaped chocolates from a poison company. And there were people walking around, dressed as seven-foot-tall blue ants. I came to Pest World to go on a miniature vacation from the news. It was late October, and the election cycle was getting me down. It was giving me anxiety in a way I've never had it before. Actually, I I initially thought this episode was going to be about the election, because this is a podcast about fear itself, but really what I learned is that there are still some things too scary for me to talk about, presidents being one of them. I have this friend named Rose Eckert. She sells these space-age-looking boxes that you can buy if you get bed bugs. They're kind of like a square tent with a heater attached. Actually, Rose explains it better. Uh, So my name is Rose Eckert, and I work for ZapBug, and we're a local Seattle company that makes heat treatment solutions for bed bugs. So they're basically portable chambers that you would put your items in, heat up to 120 degrees, and bed bugs will die at that temperature pretty quickly. So you can treat luggage, furniture, any items that you wouldn't want to put chemicals on. We have an easy solution to kill them with just heat. Rose was headed to Pest World to show off some of her company's new bed bug products, and she had some extra tickets, so she gave me one. She told me I might enjoy the conference, because it's always full of unusual people. I love coming to Pest World. I think it's great. I mean, if, if I had been asked before I started working this, what's pest control, I would just picture kind of a, a Dale Gribble type from King of the Hill. Just a, a weird loner guy who's going out and, and killing raccoons. And instead, you know, it, it's interesting to see the... It does have a very DIY, small business vibe as compared to a lot of other industries. And it's just, I think... I think it's just fun. Fun was what I needed in this moment, more than anything else. Because the thing is, I actually really like pests, and I really like bugs. And so I went to Pest World to see what was happening at the nation's biggest conference of exterminators and raccoon catchers and bedbug sniffing dogs. Here be monsters, the podcast about... Ah, here's something fun to look at. The podcast about... The unknown. No. I walked into the main exhibition hall of Past World, and I was surprised to see that it was laid out like a miniature town, with booths and vendors that were arranged as city blocks, and long avenues of squishy green carpet that ran in between them. And there were people everywhere, but I didn't know how to talk to them, how to act professional at someone else's professional conference. So I just walked around with a smile on my face until someone stopped me. And that person was Carlita Turk. She called me over to see if I was interested in a kind of home insulation that's been treated with acid, so that when bugs eat it, it turns their stomachs to cement. My name is Carlita Turk. And who do you work for? Um, Pest Control Insulation Systems. It's TAP Insulation, Thermal Acoustical Pest Control. And what what exactly is it? Um, It's a cellulose-based insulation. It's made out of recycled newsprint that is treated with boric acid. And what does the boric acid do? Um, It kills self-grooming pests. So when the pests crawl through the insulation and then they lick their bodies, then it forms a cement in their stomach, so it kills them. Do you ever feel bad for the bugs? 
now. <laughs> I don't like bugs. <laughs> Is there any bug you'd feel bad for? Is there any bug you like? Well, not a pest. Um, I'm trying to think of a bug I like. What about ladybugs? I'm really not fond of those either. Yeah. Only because in Georgia, in older homes, they can be a nuisance. You know, you just kind of like, ah, stay outside. For everyone that I met at Pest World, I tried to ask them whether their business was more of a personal vendetta against bugs and pest animals, or whether it was something else entirely. I work for High C I'm David Walters, I work for High Sea Company, and uh, our goal is to create nuisance wildlife exclusion devices that keep the nasty stuff out of the house so that it doesn't, uh, so there's no need to go in and kill it or extract it or exterminate it or do any of those things. I notice you use the word nuisance wildlife instead of pest. Nuisance wildlife control is a whole subsection. Nuisance wildlife is much bigger and nastier, you know, a raccoon that's trying to get into your attic or yeah. something like that. Okay, mm -hmm. that's good to know. So what, what are these products here that you have here? Uh, well, it's all kinds of screens and vent covers so that all the all the little guys stay outside where they belong and they don't come inside so you don't have to kill them it's essentially a, a metal cage that you would put over top of your chimney or, or something your else. chimney or your dryer vent or your soffit vent or your yep. foundation vent and so so your your solution is a entirely non-lethal one that's right i think we're, we're pretty we feel like we're the original green we're like live you know you don't have to kill it if you can keep it out so yeah. it's like it's it was green and non-lethal before that was before that was you know in vogue or fashionable do the do the other people at pest world know that you're a total peace beatnik sort of thing <laughs> that's right i try to keep it i, I look pretty corporate yeah, don't i, I mean, you, so yeah i'm looking pretty corporate and non non uh subver, non -sub -subver, subversive is that the word so, yeah i, I try not to be are you in the minority of people here who... <laughs> possibly, possibly. There, there's people walking around that say, that say the killer on their shirts. So. You've seen that? Mm -hmm. What booth? I don't know. It's, I've just seen it on people's shirts as they go by, like the oh, killers. Is, is it on the, is it the name tag? Is it on the name yeah, tag? Yeah, no, it just says the name on of the... their, their business or their product huh. or something. So, I mean, I think there's people that really enjoy, you know, exercising that kind of control over their world, so. Huh. It's about controlling your environment, right? I mean, that's what this, everybody here is trying to help people feel like they're in control of their world, whether it's their house or their lawn or their commercial building or whatever. So I think there's a motive to help, but there's a little bit of a lethal undertone. <laughs> I think that's, that's definitely what's going on. Is this, is this just about control? Is this just about people mm -hmm. wanting to control something chaotic? I think so. Chaotic? That's, my, that's my observation. I think that's what this world is about, yeah. you know, and there's better, probably better and worse ways to do it. Could you just tell me uh, your name and, and where you work? I'm Evan Bruce and I work in Winnipeg, Canada uh, with a company called Heat Assault. Yeah. Heat will kill anything with an exoskeleton. Uh, this machine we have here, um, it's our 500, so it's a 500,000 BTU system. Uh, so that's kind of what we're doing here. We're showing off our, our baby. It's kind of our big unit. Uh, Can you describe it physically? What, what yeah, so it's uh, about 6,000 pounds fully loaded. It's got a glycol reservoir in the middle. Works off of a two burner system. So each burner is 250,000 BTUs. Can I ask you about the name of the product? A heat assault. Can you describe the logo here? What's this logo? Yeah, our logo's uh, green, nice neon green heat assault, and it's got a nice picture of a bug being sniped. <laughs> it's got a target on its back. It's like, it's like a crosshair. It's, yeah, it's like crosshairs over it. Exactly, yeah. yeah what, what, does, what do you think that name like, like says to your customer? Oh, well, we're bringing, it's, uh, we want people to know that there's no chemicals involved. It's just heat. The assault part is obviously you're coming in and you're, you're killing yeah. the problem. So. Yeah. How do you feel about bugs? 
I don't like bugs. I don't, I don't hate them. Like, well, I have mixed feelings. Personally, I don't want bugs in my house. But yeah. like, do you, what do you do if you see a spider in your house? Oh no, I'll bring it outside. So I don't. I'm not oh. too. I'm not too scared of anything like that. I'll just. I, don't, I won't kill it or anything. Yeah. Yeah. I know at the lake there's dock spiders and those things are pretty big and scary. So. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Those are scary. Yeah, those are Those big. are the scariest spiders. I don't know why they, they live by the water. I, I don't think I would mess with those. As soon as Evan said the words dock spider, I immediately felt transported away from his booth, back to childhood to a house that my family owns on a lake in Idaho. It's a serene place, comically serene. I'd jump off the boat dock there, and I'd go swimming around, I'd look at the fish, I'd see an otter if I was lucky. And when it came time to come back in, I'd reach my hands around the swim ladder without looking, and I'd feel the crunch of an exoskeleton breaking and wriggling under my fingers. Dock spiders are huge, abundant, hungry, and like pretty much every species of spider in Idaho, they're completely harmless. Still, they're my least favorite thing. My whole body shivered for a moment in the exhibition hall. So, so here's what I need for you. Uh, can you can you give me a really detailed description of what you're wearing? We are wearing this Smurf what kind of like. Is this? <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> this Smurf like velour like baby blue puffy costume with this gigantic oversized ant head. So if you've watched a bug's, a bug's Life, if you watched A Bug's Life in your days, then you would know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you got big, you got big green eyes and yeah. uh, some antenna up there too. Yeah. yeah, man, and then we have this protruding butt yeah. of a, an abdomen of, a, of an ant out the back of our, out the back of our, 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 our costume. Yeah. And, and like he said, green eyes and these antennas to catch any Wi-Fi that we may be missing inside this exhibit hall on top of this gigantic, gigantically enormous uh, ant head. Yeah. And we are also wearing a Pest Roots, Pest Routes t-shirt uh -huh. with a cloud, it seems, and a Thunderbolts in the middle, in the midst of it. And on the back, it says, oh, this is the back. It also has a wearing it backwards. cloud and a thunderbolt. So, oh. so how did you guys find the find this gig? We, Craigslist. Craigslist. Yep. Yeah. And what did the title of the ad say? What did it say? We need. Know. It was like we need ant. It was like ant mascots ant needed. Yeah. It's about being an a ant celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. It's like ant celebrity needed Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You need to be here all three days to get paid out of it, but it's worth it. It's a little hot in here, man. From it's the worth the 20 bucks an hour absolutely. that we're making. Absolutely. Plus, we get the free food here, too. Absolutely, yeah. man. We get catered to, man. We get to walk around and be pests. It's kind of interesting. The only thing that bothers me is, like, people have been giving us a lot of crap. Because, like, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm sure your parents are proud of you for this job. I'm like... Making twenty bucks an hour, yeah, I'm I'm proud of myself. I tell my parents this for sure. What what do they say? I would. I haven't yet. Yeah. But yeah, my parents very supportive people. So awesome. yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks, Walt. Can I get a picture with you guys? Yeah, of course. All right, cool. In the southeast corner of the convention center, I found a border collie lying on the floor. She had an official Pest World name tag on that said K9, Lily Lou. I knelt down and Lily Lou hopped up onto my lap and licked the side of my face. Who's this here? This is Lily Lou. She's a bed bug dog. Um, I'm Sherry Swindle and the company, it's Bed Bug Mutts and we're based out of Vancouver, BC, Canada. How how do dogs smell bed bugs? Well, whether it's bed bugs or drugs or explosives, they all work the same way. They're following what's called a scent cone, 
and they're working the edges of that scent cone and narrowing it to the, because it narrows as you get back to the source where the strongest odor is. And when it's the, what they find is the strongest point of concentration, they alert. So do you, do you work on the training end of it? Is that, is that part of your job? We don't do the uh, initial training, but when you have a, a scent detection dog, you have to do maintenance exercises. And you have to, if you're going to maintain a, a dog, you ha have to have the live scent. And the only way to have a live scent is to grow a colony. What does your bed bug colony look like? <laughs> Pretty scary to a lot of people. Uh, we have, oh, I don't know, about 1,000 to 1,500 bugs and we feed it usually about once a month. We keep them in mason jars, uh, just roll up our sleeve and there's a mesh on the jar that they can put their proboscis through, uh, but they can't crawl through. So then we just put it on our bare skin and then they, in a, within 10 minutes, they're fed. Let me just get this straight. Did you, did you say that part of your job is feeding the bed bugs yep. on yourself? Yes. I mean, couldn't you get like a hog or something to do that for you? Some people do. Um, they use rabbits or uh, rats. But um, I just sit down with a glass of wine and watch TV and feed the bed bugs for a couple hours. Wow. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. Well, we get an inquiry about twice a month from people that have heard about uh, bed bug dogs and they go, oh, I want to I do that. I want to work with a dog. But as soon as they find out they have to maintain a live colony, we never hear from them again. I spotted a golden eagle. Not a real one, but a picture of one. It was printed on the side of a large device that looked half laser cannon and half leaf blower. There was a man standing at the display, smiling. I would later find out that he was a PhD entomologist. I asked what his machine was called, and he said it was called the Golden Eagle. I asked him if the tank was full of eagle repellent, and he said no. Do you mind if I ask you about this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Can I have you uh, introduce yourself and where you work and uh, what your company does? Bill Robinson. I'm the technical director of B&G Equipment. And this is one of your products here? It is. It's a thermal fogger. Uh -huh. uh, it's a primary mosquito control. And what this thing does is, is create that white smoke that you see for, for mosquito control. So how do you make fog? All how right. does it turn into fog? So here's what you're doing. You've got, you've got an insecticide mm -hmm. in this tank, mm -hmm. the red top and it's in a solvent. So you're gonna fire this, this motor up. This is a jet engine. This is what this thing is, is why it's so, that's why it's so noisy. The, inside this black thing is a long tube that starts here. It's a jet engine, so you put fuel here and it explodes. So when you fire this thing up, there's that rumble, bang. When it starts, it's a jet engine. So it's, it's 12, 1200 degrees centigrade. This is really hot. Yeah, this is really hot. Now, step back a little bit. So it's coming out of here. It's following this tube, circles around once. And see that? You're injecting that flammable liquid into that hot air stream. And it vaporizes it immediately. And then as soon as it exits, it condenses and creates that white smoke. Yes. So that's what you're doing. Is it loud? Is it loud? It's extremely loud. It's a manly sound. You fire that thing up and yeah. bang. <laughs> mm, you know when it's running. Yeah. It's loud. You might be wondering at this point whether you should pause this episode to visit YouTube to find the sound of the Golden Eagle mosquito fogger, right? Well, let me save you the trouble. <laughs> Do you love bugs, hate bugs, or have mixed feelings as an entomologist? Uh, you know, I, I, was, I taught at university for 30 years. I taught entomology. So, you know, they're just, I guess, a scientific interest. I don't like those stink bugs that get in my house either. <laughs> no one likes those things. <laughs> they annoy the brains out of me. <laughs> but uh, uh, they got to live too. How, what makes a pest animal a pest? Uh, and, and that's a valid question. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something that has to be defined. It's like a weed, you, you know, and a weed's a pest. It's, it's that insect out of place. 
Uh, and uh, you know, we're we're a species that um, that evolved to create a sacred space. We eventually moved indoors. We eventually created a space that had walls and a top and a door, uh, and that space became sacred to us. Um, when, when we were just in lean-tos, uh, not so sacred. But we put doors on it, we put ceilings on it. It's a sacred space. Now something has come into that sacred space. It could be uninvited. And I think that's the link. I didn't, I didn't invite that rat into my space. I didn't invite that insect into my space. When it comes in unwelcomed, uninvited, it becomes a pest, doesn't it? You know, if it's a weed uh, in a cornfield, uh, uninvited, thank you very much. You know, be on the roadside if you like. Not in the cornfield. I, I think same with insects. You know, those stink bugs. Oh, they don't bother me. Oh, except when they get in my house. You know, they just sort of annoy me. But I think it goes deeper for a lot of people who are, who are not an entomologist. And they think, no, I did. You know, it's a it's a, a cerebral thing. I, that that insect shouldn't be here. I think at the heart of it, it's a pest because it's in our space. If you see you see a bug in your house, you don't want it there. Do you you just take it outside? Yeah, take it outside. You just open the front door. I think entomologists in general think, oh, come on, oh, it's a silly stink bug, you know, or it's a ladybird beetle, oh, let it out, you know, out you go. Fair enough. Okay. I really appreciate it. All right, thank thank you. you very much. All right. Yeah, take care. When I was talking with David Walters, the wildlife deterrent guy, I asked him who he most respected at Pestworld, who I absolutely needed to talk to. He hesitated at first, but then he told me to go visit Alan Hewat, and he pointed me towards the far corner of the convention center. I walked for a long time and looked at a lot of name tags before I saw his corner booth covered in strange tools. The booth had a green backdrop with a giant photo of a raccoon printed on it. It was almost the end of the day, and people were just starting to pack up. I walked up to Alan and I said, Alan? With a question mark. Alan looked at me, a bit confused as if he was trying to place me, and I said, David Walters from High Sea sent me. There's some nice looking snare poles you have there. Alan agreed to talk to me. His wife and business partner Carol was there too, but she preferred to stay off mic. Ah, here's something fun to look at. Let's look at this flock reflector. Great for seagulls and pigeons. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got a flat stainless steel base on a small, probably about a 10 inch pole. And it's got these three chrome discs that spin in the wind on a ball bearing swivel. Mm -hmm. And the slightest little wind spins these discs. Anything that shines and bounces the light around birds don't like. The other kind of bird that it's really useful for um, is woodpeckers. Yeah, my name's uh, Alan Hewat, and I'm the president of a company by the name of Wildlife Control Supplies out of East Granby, Connecticut, and I'm standing here uh, in Seattle, Washington at the National Pest Management Association annual convention called Pest World. What can you tell me about wildlife control supplies? Way back in 1996, I had the idea that let's start a company to bring all of the supplies that a professional would need on their truck to respond to any request by a, a property owner, a building manager that's having a problem with wildlife and, and having any piece of equipment they might need to address that problem. Some good gloves there. Yeah, these are the the most robust glove that we carry. Yep. Fully Kevlar lined, stainless steel staples in the back of the hand. Mm -hmm. So if you're handling, you know, a large raccoon or a possum or right. anything like that kind of an that sized animal, mm -hmm. um, these protective gloves would save you from getting a a puncture bite. What's a, what's this thing here? Is this a snare pole? Pole, this yeah. is your snare pole with your noose on it. About, you know, 98% of your animal control departments use this pole. Um, it's called a catch-all pole. Um, it's probably the best pole on the market. It's made out of aircraft aluminum. All the parts are replaceable. Um, been around since probably the turn of the century. 
So it's a, a long, uh, long time company. You mean, you mean this century or the last one? Ah, uh, the last one, I guess. Yeah, oh, you're right. right. Yeah, right. sometime in the 20s, I think this was invented. Um, it's to handle an animal, or maybe if you need to reach down into a dumpster and um, retrieve a raccoon, that's what this pole is used for. Uh, but spring loaded, so you can let the animal go um, and, and easily retrieve it out of a confined space. How long would it take for you to catch a raccoon with that? Oh, minutes. You know, one, one thing, if you're going to be in this business, you can't be afraid of wildlife. It's not a business you want to get into if you're the least bit squeamish about wildlife. I've been at this now um, in excess of 30 years. So I'm not really afraid of the wildlife, but I, I, I do respect it. Um, they can harm you. They can bite you. Um, it'll be an expensive trip to the hospital. I think that after spending so much time around pest management folk, I was starting to feel genuinely comfortable at this professional conference of a profession that I'm not a part of. It's, it's really weird, but I felt my mind start to wander, and suddenly it felt appropriate in the moment to break out of the mode of interviewing with questions and answers, and I started just kind of talking with Alan. And so what happened next was my own fault. It wasn't anything that bad, but it was, it was still my fault. As I was wrapping up the interview, Alan asked me if I knew when the episode would come out, and I said it could be, it might be, it probably would be the day after the election. And then I awkwardly smiled and made this kind of scoffing sound into the recorder, and Alan said, oh, yeah, right. Alan paused for a moment before starting his next thought, and we talked for the next two minutes about broad things related to the election. People filtered out past us on their way to dinner, and it felt like the staff was getting ready to turn off the lights in the cavernous room. Alan never used the names of the political parties or the candidates, never said a positive or negative thing about either, never even gave a hint to his leaning. But Carol started making a face that made it clear that she'd rather this conversation wasn't being recorded. And honestly, I think she was right. There wasn't anything to gain. I'd invited my election anxiety to seep into the one place I was trying to protect it from, Pest World 2016. I thanked Alan and Carol for the interview, and I asked if I could take their picture in front of their banner. I had Alan hold the aircraft aluminum catch-all pole, and Carol wore the metal-reinforced raccoon-grabbing glove. They stood in front of their banner and smiled. It was time to call it a day for Pest World 2016. But as I was leaving, I played back the conversation with Alan in my head. Earlier, he'd said something to me. He said that you have to respect the thing you work with. He was talking specifically about raccoons and other wildlife, but I think Alan was right on a broader level too. His conclusion concerns me though, because fear is the one thing that I work with day in and day out. But even after four plus years of doing this podcast, I still don't respect fear. I still hate it, intensely. It makes me wonder whether personal fear is something to keep running headlong towards. And it makes me wonder if I'll know when it comes time to set down the microphone and pick up the mosquito fogger for a while. Because I'm still not afraid of any pests or bugs. Unless you count politicians or dock spiders. Are, are you coming back next year? Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be back at every pest world. We go to Bedbug Summit as well, which is another convention. And if that was in Seattle, I would have brought you to that as well. <laughs> my pass for Pest World 2016 came from the company Zap Bug through my friend Rose Eckert. Rose works customer service for the company, and she's also in charge of making these great bed bug videos. Do you have bed bugs? My first word of advice to you is don't panic. You can get rid of them, and we're here to tell you just how to do that. We have one of them up on our website. 
Also, there's a video of Alan Hewat explaining the different kinds of rodent bait that his company sells. When I first got involved with nuisance wildlife, I was looking for baits that would specifically target certain species, as I'm sure you are as well. And of course, we also have the video demonstrating the proper use of the Curtis Dynafog Golden Eagle Mosquito Fogger. Also on our website, we have a bunch of photos of the people and products that you heard on this episode, and a picture of me with my arms around the two giant ants. The ants' names are Roger Johnson and Evan Church. And when they're not being ants, Roger's an actor, and Evan's in a Seattle band called Local Point. We have a link on our website, hbmpodcast.com. My name is Jeff Entman, and I produced this episode along with help from Bethany Denton. Our editor at KCRW is Nick White. Music on this show came from Sarocell and Flowers. And speaking of music, I'm going to tell you that we're on Spotify now. And so if you use that thing, just give a search for our name, Here Be Monsters, and look for our rainbow HBM logo. Here Be Monsters is a part of the independent producer project from KCRW. Thanks for listening. More episodes soon.